Now, those are the seven keys to citizenship, but I really wanted to talk about freedom. Um, freedom. Um, why is freedom important? And it's funny, isn't it, that we don't talk about it. We might talk about services for people with learning difficulties. Uh, we might talk about inclusion. Um, you know, we might talk about community. But we don't really talk about freedom very much, I don't think. These are five, I think, really good reasons why we should take the idea of freedom really, really seriously. Number one, freedom is one of the fundamental human rights. That's not a small thing to say. Human rights are at the core of what it is to be together, to have rights, to, ha to be treated well by others. Rights are fundamental to who we are as human beings and the right to freedom, to a life that you can control. What some disabled people call independent living. Yeah? That is very, very critical. Freedom also feels good. You know, if you want to find out why people are frustrated, angry, or things are not working very well, a good question to ask is, are people's freedoms being frustrated? Are people not able to do what they want? Because that's one of the major things that leads to conflict, confusion, problems in people's lives. Now we know that that's also, freedom is complicated and there are times when we want to say, well, let's manage this well, let's work out what people can do and what people need uh, help with and, and maybe even what people can't do. Um, but if we constantly frustrate freedom, if we if we don't pay attention to freedom, then the impact on that will be pain and suffering uh, and unhappiness for lots of people. Freedom is also really practically important. Um, if you don't figure out a mechanism by which people can be free, then you'll find that people can't have really basic things like tenancy rights, employ people, enter into contracts with people. Lots of things in the law are about people's ability to act independently, have a way of doing that, and achieve certain things. And again, those who are familiar with the law will know that sometimes, legally, we have to do a bit of work to make that work. You know, um, I've helped people buy their own homes, but we've had to set up a trust in order to make that happen. So sometimes freedom requires a lot, quite a lot of extra work. But that doesn't mean it doesn't, it doesn't apply. Yeah? Freedom actually requires work in everybody's life. So the fact that we need to do a bit of extra work when it comes to some folk because they need help with decision making doesn't make freedom irrelevant, it just means we've got to do that extra work. <coughs> One of the most important things for me is that freedom's important in terms of how respect is generated. If we go back to you know, the peak population of when the institutions, people put in institutions, it was the 1970s. What people argued strongly uh, was that those things were bad for people. And there was lots of evidence that they were bad for people because people were being abused and hurt and harmed. Um, and people tried to understand, well, what would we do instead? What are we really trying to do? What's wrong with these institutions? And one of the theories that people, people as old or older than me in the room, there might be a few of you, uh, but there were theories like normalisation or social role valorisation. Anybody yeah. remember these things? A few, a few nods, not everybody. But what these were trying to do was figure out why is it that it, sometimes human beings get themselves in such a place that they feel it's okay to treat people abusively. They feel it's okay to disrespect them and not to pay attention to human rights. That's what normalisation, what social role valorisation were trying to explore. Now, what is it that stops people treating people with respect? And they argued, I think persuasively, that if you, if you treat people like they're too different, or they're a bit weird, or they belong in these funny places, then the standards of human behaviour fall. If we put people in a funny place where, not like everybody else, what tends to happen is that other people start thinking, oh, well, it's all right to treat them abusively. And we see the same today in places like Winterbourne View. There are, you know, there are 11,000 people in out-of-area placements uh, around the country, places like Winterbourne View, where the kind of abuses that some of you might have seen on television are going on. 
I was working with some families in the southwest of England uh, recently who said that their, whose kids have been in Winterbourne View, they said Winterbourne View was one of the least bad places their kids have been. All right, so the notion that all of this abuse has gone away, all these institutional problems has gone away, is wrong. It's still with us. It used to be 65,000 people in institutions, so now it's maybe 11,000, so that's some kind of achievement, but uh, it's also noticeable that some of these places we're paying four, five, six times as much money for as the institutions, so we're spending about the same amount of money on institutions just for about a fifth or a sixth of the number of people, which is kind of shocking if you think about it. So these ideas we're talking about, how do we help people, and the term normalisation, how do we help people live a more normal life where they're not likely to be disrespected? Now, see, my background is I'm a philosopher, and philosophers don't like theories that are too peculiar. And normalisation was a bit peculiar. It was very good, but it was also a bit peculiar. And it was peculiar in this way, which is that the idea of normalizing the person or their environment only makes sense if you assume that normal is good. Yes? That's the only way you can get that theory off the ground. Um, so in a way, what the, the philosophy of normalization, if you can call it that, is it was a special philosophy for special people. But then that doesn't make sense because it was meant to be about everyone. You, can you see the problem? It's a bit of a funny problem. It's a kind of philosopher's problem, maybe. But to have a special philosophy that only applies to special people about them not being special doesn't make sense to a philosopher. So I wanted to start thinking about what are the kind of ideas and theories that apply to all of us? I don't want a special philosophy that just applies to people with learning difficulties. I want to think about all of this for all of us. And I think the idea of citizenship is such an idea. What we're trying to do for each other is treat each other as equals, as citizens. Citizenship is, in a way, just maybe a fancy word for treating each other as equals. Yeah. My wife doesn't like the word citizen. There isn't a brilliant word. Uh, but the word citizen has been used in roughly this way for over two and a half thousand years. Whereas words like normalisation we just made up last week, really. Yes? So I also like things that have a history. So the idea of citizenship isn't a small idea. It is important because it's really fundamental to exploring how people who are different treat each other as equals. And the other really important thing about freedom is it is not risky, it's the pathway to safety. I've got a little bit frustrated with, um, I understand where it comes from and I value where it comes from in the heart when people start talking about risk taking and the importance of risk taking, but I kind of think sometimes we've got uh, this upside down, um, actually freedom's important to keep us safe because free, it's freedom that allows us to say I don't want to do this anymore, this isn't working for me, this is dangerous. And when we have systems that don't protect people's freedoms, that's when we put them in dangerous places when they can't change. It's freedom that keeps us safe. Freedom isn't risky. So we have to pay a lot of attention to freedom.